I'm not going to review all of algebra. I assume you're in a math class right now that you're doing algebra, uh, at least on some level, uh, every day or most days in your math classes, or you've done it previously. So this is not going to start from the beginning of algebra. But I do want to cover two major rules, two major tips that you have to keep in mind. If anything else comes up, if, for example, you keep making a, a, cons a consistent error or you have some question about how to do a particular technique, let me know and I'll make a video on it. But right now I want to stick to these two major rules. And the first rule is uh, the goal of algebra really is to isolate your variable on one side of the equation and have everything else, numbers, constants, perhaps other variables on the other side, right? So if we're solving for x, we want to get x to one side and we want to have everything else on the other. And often we're going to have x on one side and a number on the other because x is going to equal that number. And then this is a very important one. Whatever you do to one side of the equation, you must do to the other side. And the key word here is side. As we're going to see in a second, we don't do addition or subtraction or multiplication or division or squaring or square rooting. We don't do that to just one term on a side. We do that to the entire side. And this makes a huge difference in a lot of these questions. So let's take a look at this as an example of that. So what a lot of students do at this point, we've got 4x plus 6 over 5 minus 2. Uh, t is 4, so we're just going to set this equal to 4. What a lot of students do is they want to get rid of this 5 on the bottom. So they go ahead, they multiply this by 5, they multiply that by 5. That gets them 4x plus 6 minus 2 equals 20. Go on from here, you'll solve, you'll get something that isn't correct because there was an error made in this earlier step. And it goes back to rule number two. You cannot just multiply one piece of your equation by five and then multiply the other side by five. When you multiply by five, which you can do, you do it to the entire side. So both terms are going to be multiplied by five. And this is only one term on this side, but it gets multiplied by five because you apply the multiplication to both sides. Where students get confused, where I think the source of the confusion comes from, is let's say we started instead by adding 2 to both sides. The way we write it and the way then we think about it is that we're adding 2 almost like we're adding it directly to this negative 2 so that they cancel. So we then think, oh, then I can just multiply this by 5 just like I added 2 to this term. But really, if we wrote this out in detail, what we're doing is we're adding 2 to the entire side, right? We put this in parentheses just like we put it in parentheses before when we multiplied. Put this in parentheses and we add 2. And now when you add 2, you're not going to add 2 to each of these terms. You just add 2 to the side. And due to the rules of uh, commutative and associative rules for addition, you only just add that 2 in. It just And it ends up just canceling out the negative 2. So we're not actually targeting negative 2 with its own plus 2 to cancel it. We're adding 2 to both sides. It just ends up working out that the 2 and the negative 2 cancel. So just keep this in mind. When you're adding terms, you know, it may look like you're adding it to just one term, but really you're adding it to the whole side so that if you decided to, let's say, multiply by 2, you've got to multiply both these terms by 2, not just one of them. So let's continue with the solving of this one. So we'll add 2 to both sides. We'll get 4x plus 6 over 5 is equal to 6. Now we'll go ahead, multiply both sides by 5. That's going to get us 4x plus 6 equals 30. Subtract 6 from both sides. We'll get 4x is equal to 24. Divide both sides by 4. And I'll get x is 6. And that's my answer. So remember, when you apply operations to an equation, you apply it to the entire side. Another example of this is a side note. If I had this, you can't square root just the x squared. You can't even square root the whole side and then make this then equal to x minus 2 or something like that. When you square root the both sides, you square root the entire thing. And as it's going to turn out, it's not going to be so simple to square root this. So it's just that's another example. And we will see this elsewhere. Sometimes on the harder questions in the algebra section, you will be uh, dealing with fractions. And you're going to have coefficients in your linear equations that are fractional. And you, there's two ways to tackle this. Either you can combine the fractions using the lowest common denominator, the LCD. This is something that you learned in probably elementary school when you first learned to add fractions. Or you can multiply by the LCD, by the 
least common denominator. So if you were going to do the first method, basically you'd look at these denominators and you ask what is the number that each of these numbers can divide into? And you know, there are an infinite number of numbers that would satisfy that, but we want to try to find the smallest one. It just makes our lives a little bit easier. So when we look at these, we might realize that 40 is a number that each of these could divide into. 4 goes into 40 10 times, 8 into 45 times, and so on. Then we would transform all these fractions into fractions with denominators of 40. Right? You would multiply, for example, this by 10 over 10. That would get you 30 over 40. This would become 15 over 40. This would become 16 over 40, and so on. And then you combine them and finish the equation. I generally don't like doing it this way. I actually prefer multiplying instead both sides of the equation by the LCD. So what would that look like? Well, again, the LCD we've determined is 40. So I'm going to multiply both sides by 40. And remember, that means each of these terms is going to be multiplied by 40. So when I do 40 times 3 quarters x, that 4 is going to cancel out a 4 in the 40, leaving us with a 10. And 10 times 3 is 30. So I'm going to get 30x. This 8 will go into 40, leaving us 5. 5 times 3 will give us 15x. This 5 goes into 40, leaving us an 8. 8 times 2 is 16. And 10 goes into 40, leaving us a 4. 4 times 11 is 44. So this turns our equation, which used to be fractional with fractional coefficients, into an equation with integer coefficients, which is much easier to solve. We get 15x equals 60. So divide both sides by 15, and we'll get x equals 4. Don't forget that cross-multiplying, which is a really useful strategy when you have, say, something like this, 4x plus 2 over 6 equals 3x minus 2 over 4, right? You might know, okay, I can just go ahead and multiply these two sides together, and then I can solve it from there. Note that you can also do this when a fraction equals a fraction, or if the fraction equals a single term, or a single even an integer, as it does here, right? So we have 4t minus 1 over 4t plus 1 equals 3. Now you might look at this and get a little bit stuck. You might be tempted to start plugging in numbers for t. Uh, that's often not going to lead you anywhere profitable, profitable because it's just going to be too hard to come up with the t. But what we can do is this 3 is just the same thing as 3 over 1. It's just really just a fraction. So what we can do now that we have it in this is cross multiply like we would in this example. When we do that here, we're going to get 4t minus 1 is equal to 12t plus 3. Remember that 3 has got to distribute to each of these terms. Move some stuff around. Subtract 4t from both sides. We'll get 8t. Subtract 3 from both sides. We get negative 4. So divide both sides by negative by 8, and we're going to get t is negative a half. And you know, going back to that plugging in, you would probably never think to plug in negative a half, which is why plugging in is not very good. But remember, you can just make this 3 over 1, cross multiply. You're good to go. Let me actually give myself a bit more room here. There's a whole species of question on the SAT where you're going to have to find a constant. They're going to have some sort of equation, a linear equation, quadratic equation, maybe even exponential. And there's going to be a constant in it that you need to solve for directly because that's what they want. Or you need to solve for the constant so that you can solve for something else. And the general rule when you're solving for constants is that you want to find a point or points x comma y to plug in. You want to find a solution to that equation that you could plug into the equation to help you solve for that constant. Now, if you're solving for multiple constants, you'll probably need multiple points. Where can you get these points? Well, sometimes they're in the text of the question directly. They'll tell you 3, 4 is the solution of the equation. Well, there you go. As we see in this one, they might tell you a bit indirectly. In this case, they tell us y equals 35 when x equals 7. But really, that's just a point. That's the point 7, 35. So that would be our point there. You might also get it off of a graph. You might also get it off of a chart or a table. But you got to find that point because once you have that point, a question like this isn't too bad. So we've got y equals cx. We've got this point 735, and we can plug that in. So now it says follows, and we can now solve for c. Divide both sides by 7. We get c is 5. And now that we have the constant, we can use the constant in the next part to find the value of y when x equals 2. So we're looking for y. C would be 5. 2 is going to be the x value that we're looking at. So y would be 10. 
So when you're solving for constants, we'll see some harder questions of this in the future. When you're solving for constants, plug in a point. When you plug in your points, that can help you solve for that constant. Now, sometimes on the SAT, they're not going to ask you in an algebra question for what does X equal or what does Y equal. They ask you for something a bit different. They ask you maybe what is 8X plus 4 equal or what is X plus Y equal or 2R minus 3 or P plus 1. And in these cases, you could, if you'd like, most of the time, solve directly for just the variable or variables and then do the operation necessary to get the answer. So you could, in theory, depending on the question, solve for X individually and then solve for Y individually. And then once you've got X and Y, add them together and then you've got the answer. There's two problems with this. Number one, you might make a mistake and you might solve for X and then forget that they want X plus Y and then you grid in X value or you pick X value in the multiple choice and you get it wrong because they want X plus Y. So there's an issue of making, making silly mistakes. The other issue is that sometimes you can't solve for them individually. Maybe it's impossible to solve for X and solve for Y separately. But where it would be possible to solve it is to solve for them together. And then third point, it's sometimes just faster and easier to solve for those expressions directly. So let me show you an example of what I mean by this. So we have 2X plus 1 equals 10. We could, if we want, subtract 1 from both sides, divide both sides by 2. We'll get x is 9 halves, so we can take that 9 halves and plug that in for x, and then do 8 times 9 halves plus 4. Okay, it could work. It's just a little bit longer. There's the potential for making a mistake when you plug 9 halves in here, because 8 times 9 halves is a little bit strange. But you could do it. What's the easier way? The easier way to realize is 2x plus 1, what could we do to make that look like 8x plus 4? Well, really... All we need to do is multiply it by 4. When we multiply it by 4, it's equal to 8x plus 4. Remember by rule 2, when I multiply one side by 4, I have to multiply the other side by 4. So when I do that, I'm going to get 8x plus 4 equals 40. And there we go. We're done. So if you had plugged in 9 halves for x, 8 times 9 halves is 36. 36 plus 4 is 40. You would have gotten the same answer. It's fine. But notice how this is really just one step. Nice and quick, nice and direct, very hard to make a mistake. Now, while it's true that solving directly is often the best, sometimes it's unnecessary. I mean, in this case, if I just solve for P in the simple equation and I add 1 to it, I'm done. I don't really need to solve directly for P plus 1. That's a little bit unnecessary. It's a little redundant to do that because all I need to do is just add 1. The one virtue, perhaps, for solving for P plus 1 directly is that you don't give them P as your answer. That's the big thing you need to be careful of here. They want P plus 1, not P. So if you go through this process, get P, they'll say P is 6, and then you bubble in 6 or you pick choice C, which is 6, you're wrong because they want P plus 1, so the answer would have been 7. So just be extra careful if you're going to solve for the variable to give them what they want. So let's go ahead. We've got 13 minus 10P is equal to, we'll combine this, negative 3P plus 20. We will... Uh, add 10p to both sides, subtract 20 from both sides. We get 7p is negative 7. So p is negative 1. Now don't go ahead and grid in negative 1, or I guess you can't grid in negative 1. Don't pick negative 1 as your answer because we're looking for p plus 1. So p plus 1 is negative 1 plus 1, which is 0. So 0 would be the final answer to this question.